distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor to welcome you all again to this morning's Third Friday Forum Lecture at the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies. The theme for this morning's lecture is Public Policy and Democratic Functioning and will be delivered by His Excellency Pavan Kumar Varma, former Ambassador of India to Bhutan and currently advisor to the Chief Minister of Bihar, India. Your Excellency, I, on behalf of the Royal Institute of Governance and Strategic Studies, would like to warmly welcome you to your home, Bhutan, and thank you specifically for taking time away from your busy schedule to give us a talk on public policy and democratic functioning at a time when Bhutan, one of the world's newest democracies, successfully concluded the second parliamentary elections this year. Your Excellency, we at RICS have been looking forward immensely to your visit and today's talk. I would now like to invite all participants Sri Yangden to give the welcome address. <coughs> Excellency, Pavan K. Varma, Tashus, Honorable Board Members of RICS, and distinguished audience, I wish you all a very good morning. And once again, on behalf of the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies and the course participants, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone gathered here for the Friday Forum. As a special and prominent feature of the programs at RICS, we have the Friday Forum lectures by eminent speakers from around the world. For this week, Friday Forum, I'm really honored to introduce and welcome our speaker, His Excellency Pawan K. Varma, former ambassador of India to Bhutan and currently the advisor to the Chief Minister of Bihar, Sri Nitish Kumar. The topic for today's lecture is public policy and democratic functioning. Ladies and gentlemen, a few paragraphs gathered from the internet will not suffice and will not do justice to pay tribute to His Excellency's rich experience and great achievements. Nevertheless, I've tried my best in covering as much as I could find on His Excellency's life and would like to provide some highlights of His Excellency's life and achievements. A writer and a highly acclaimed diplomat, Ambassador Pavan K. Varma was born in November 1953 is a graduate of St. Stephen's College, New Delhi, where he studied history honors and received the first position. Subsequently, His Excellency acquired a degree in law. Joined the Indian Foreign Service in 1976, His Excellency's career as a diplomat has seen him serve in several countries, including New York and Moscow. In New York, he was the Indian Sorry, in New York, he was with India's permanent mission to the United Nations. He also served as the executive assistant to the chairman of the group of 77. In Moscow, he was the director of the Jawaharlal Nehru Cultural Center in the Indian Embassy. He has also been High Commissioner of India to Cyprus, as well as director of the Nehru Center in London. His assignments in India include dialogue press secretary to the President of India, spokesman in the Ministry of External Affairs, Joint Secretary for Africa and Director General of the Indian Council for Cultural Relations, New Delhi, and Indian Ambassador to Bhutan. His Excellency has been conferred an honorary doctoral degree for his contribution to the fields of diplomacy, literature, culture, and aesthetics by the University of Indianapolis in 2005 served as the Indian Ambassador to Bhutan in, to, from 2009 to October 2012 and is a recipient of Duk Tokse Award in 2012 for His Excellency's service to Bhutan in bringing socio-economic growth. In addition to his diplomatic career, His Excellency has established a name for himself as a writer of depth and insight, 
and is an author of over more than 20 books. As a great lover of literature, His Excellency conceptualized the Mountain Echoes, a literary festival in the country under the patronage of the Queen Mother, Aji Lujua Mwongju, and is one of the eminent speakers at the festival. His first book was the highly successful and critically applauded biography of the Urdu poet Mirza Ghalib, titled Ghalib the Man, the Times, and this book has been translated into several Indian languages. His Excellency's books on Bhutan include Bhutan Through the Lens of the King and When Loss is King. His Excellency has authored several prominent and best selling books like Avelis of Old Delhi, Galib the Man, the Times, Krishna the Playful Divine, Great Indian Middle Class, Becoming Indian, Love and Lust and Kama Sutra. His Excellency has also translated several poems from Gulzar, Kafi Asni, and Atal Bihari Vajpayee into English openly. We are indeed honored and privileged to have Your Excellency with us today for the Friday Forum Lecture. And I'm sure that we will have a great experience and great interaction. Thank you. Once again, welcome to this session. Thank you, Tsuri. Um, now I would like to invite the Excellency Mahmoud to deliver the lecture. Director of Red Sharin Brinzing, the shows, distinguished guests, our Council General, Mr. Sharma, Chief Election Commissioner, and above all, the current batch at Briggs. As I was coming up from the car just now, somebody said, welcome me here and said, Your Excellency, welcome back home. And that I think is very true. Because for me, Bhutan will always remain a home. It is a country I have come to love. It is a country for which I have great respect. And Bhutan is an experience which continues to live with you. Since I left Bhutan, I have been caught on the treadmill of ceaseless political activism. But in the midst of the heat and dust and the din and the noise, Bhutan remains in the corner of my mind, an area of solace, of comfort, of a place where, in many ways, I rediscovered myself and redefined what my aims and goals in life must be. It's a debt of gratitude I owe this country. And it's a debt that I can never repay. <coughs> Therefore, when I received an invitation from His Majesty the King to come to Wales, whatever my preoccupations, this had priority, not only because it was command from His Majesty, but because of the pull of Fuja to be back here. I recall having discussed with His Majesty many months ago, a year ago maybe, about Prince and His Majesty's enthusiasm and commitment and clarity was very, very transparent and I remember saying to him, 
that this would be an excellent idea. And I'm glad that now today as a result of his vision that we are seeing the emergence in Bhutan of an institute which is going to be of world-class excellence. Please accept my heartiest congratulations on its commencement and let me begin again by saying how honored I am to be of its here today. <coughs> Public policy and democratic functioning was a subject which General Lee and I discussed on the phone. The line was bad. I was in Kasoli up in the Himalayas day before yesterday. And General B and I were trying to talk. And I thought that we agreed on something else, but I'm very happy to speak on this subject as well. Because it's so relevant. And it's something that I can share with you. I never have a prepared text. But I want to share some thoughts with you. Coming from personal experience in my involvement, peripherally or more centrally with policy making, in the framework of a democracy. And I believe this subject is particularly relevant to Bhutan as it has made the courageous transition under the like guidance and leadership of their majesties towards becoming a constitutional monarchy and a parliamentary democracy and being one of the youngest democracies in the world. The challenges are ahead of you. The experience you have had so far is a good augury that you will be more than able to overcome those challenges. But you should be prepared to accept the fact that there will be challenges in the functioning of a democracy and in the making of public policy in the context of a democracy. Very often, the making of policy appears to be simplistic. Here are a set of coordinates. Somebody presents pros and cons and options. And people always make the best choice among different choice options before them. It's somewhat neat, easily accomplished, like a boardroom meeting, where ultimately the proprietor has already decided what needs to be done. Alas, or perhaps fortunately, it doesn't really happen like that in a democracy. In a democracy, policy making becomes a very complex affair. And I will share with you as we go along, why is it complex? And this is not going to be a critique of democracy. Because as Churchill said, Democracy is the worst form of polity except that there are none better. So we have to accept that as a given and then try and see the many aspects of what policy making is about. Why is policy making so complex? Because it involves choices. What I say to you today, as I share my thoughts, may appear to be simplistic, but I want especially those who are in this course and who are going to be future leaders to try and follow because they will be in the thick, in the midst of such situation. Policy making is complex because it involves choices. Choices about who the beneficiaries of this policy must be. What should be the ideological orientation of policy making? What should be the direction of policy making? What kind of resources are required to pursue a particular choice in policy making? So decisions are not made in a void. 
Policy making is complex because it involves choice and because it deals with people. Who makes the choice? In a totalitarian system, on the surface it appears to be a less complex affair because the variables that determine choice have been reduced to a single focus of political concentration. I have had personal witness of serving in the former Soviet Union and in East Europe at the time when there was communist rule. Ultimately, all decisions are made in the name of the people. The Communist parties came to power in the Soviet Union in the name of the people fighting a cause which was just, which was relevant and which deserved for them to win in those circumstances. Having come to power without the check of transparently functioning democratic institutions, the same set of people became immune to dissent and indifferent to debate. There was no challenge to the decisions they made. It assumed ludicrous proportions. I don't know how many of you have gone to Moscow, but it's a beautiful city, but there are seven buildings which are skyscrapers built in the old Soviet style. And all of them are similar in different parts of the city. But there is one of those buildings which <coughs> peculiarly has two different designs on the facade. And I asked a senior functionary in the Soviet, then Soviet government, I said, how has this building got one kind of facade on one side and another kind of facade on the other? And he laughed and he said, you know, the architects had put up two choices before Stalin. Absent-mindedly, he ticked both. <laughs> and nobody had the courage to go back to him and ask, which of these is your choice? And so they took the path of actually building a building with both those facades. And it's a living visible monument to decision making when it's outside the democratic orbit because that is how decisions were taken. Vast and sweeping decisions. Today as Bhutan is a democracy, you must understand what freedom, what freedom's democracy gives you, which we begin to take for granted and I see that happening in my own country. But within a totality and there have been many. There are military dictatorships, there are political totalitarian systems as in the Soviet Union. Where vast and sweeping decisions were taken affecting the lives of millions of people. Entire people moved from one region to another. The Gulags. With no one to question their decisions. And all decisions made in the name of the people. That is the ultimate tendency of political public policy making in the absence of democracy that everything is done in the name of the people and the people don't have a voice. <laughs> what changes? What changes in a democracy? What changes in a democracy that public policy making is about people, but people can express what they expect that public policy to deliver, and people are not homogeneous. One of the great and enduring revelations to anyone.
channel goes slightly below the surface in the working of a democracy is the multiplicity of vested interests not entirely malignant but benevolent vested interests in the function of the political system. People constitute interests. There are the interests of the corporate rich. There are the interests of the poor farmers. There are the interests of the nascent entrepreneurs. There are the interests of the traders. There is the interest of the middle class. There is the interest of the labor unions. There is the interest of the unemployed. There is the influence. In, there is the interest of the educated who are unemployed. It's a constant season inferno of interest playing out silently or overtly all the time as an input to policy making. Sometimes they are expressed, sometimes they are sought to be expressed through some other agents, sometimes there are protests to express them, sometimes there are lobbies to, to voice them, but these interests are clashed. And because it's a democracy, often they are clashing openly. And public policy has to be made while taking into account that people will express choices and people's interests clash and can often be contradictory. How do you choose a policy which pleases all? How do you choose a policy which pleases only one section? Because when I talk of public policy in a democracy, I am not merely talking of the electoral system. Democracy consists of many institutions, a free press, a judiciary. There are many elements to a democratic structure and they are all functioning and there is an executive which has to decide on policy making under overseeing the sea of clashing interests. The challenge of public policy making in a democracy is how do you make these choices? Because there are constraints. There are huge constraints of conflicting priorities, of the constraints of resources, of expectations of people based on the promises made reasonably or rationally at the time of elections. One thing that happens in a democracy is that expectations always outstrip performance. That is why you call it the anti-incumbency factor. In order to get power, politicians promise the sun and the moon. When in power, people expect them to deliver at least a small star. And so there is this constant tussle between expectation and promise. Then there are systemic constraints. One of the constraints in India is that governments are a coalition. And often coalitions have 18, 19 constituents. And each of them represents incidentally a certain interest or a regional interest or a certain overriding priority which they believe is more important than the other partners concerned. So it's a systemic constraint. Then there is the arithmetic of democracy. Please understand this very simple thing is not taught in your mathematics class. It's called the arithmetic of democracy. Who matters more? It's a numerical sum. I will elaborate on this a little more. But it's a numerical sum. This is the voters. Analyze the voters. There will be a larger segment among them 
which represent one particular interest. Who matters more at the time of voting? In India, for instance, it is impossible today to ignore those who were earlier at the lowest rung of the social and economic ladder, the Dalits, the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. Earlier, this group was willing to be quiescent, cooperative cogs in somebody else's being. Somebody else decided the agenda. They were willing to vote according to that other person's priority. After 14 elections, 65 years of democracy, they have become politically empowered and their viewpoint is that we will get from the ballot box what the system will not otherwise yield. And they have realized the power and the potential of political cohesion of becoming collectively a, a pivotal lobbying group within the policy making set. These are our priorities. Land, jobs, roads, electricity to the village, social change, reservation, affirmative action. And no political party can afford to ignore them because numerically as well, quite apart from the fact that socially and politically, you need to work for this class. But I can assure you the way charismatic or democracy functions, I can assure you that if the Dalits constituted 3% of the total electorate, even though their demands were very high and very much relevant, governments could have ignored them. Political parties could have ignored them. But if they are 28% of the electorate, you can't ignore them. So you have to make decisions in terms of what is the constitution of the electorate and by pleasing which part, part of it you get maximum returns in order to retain power or retain popularity. Which is the arithmetic of democracy. You go wrong in the arithmetic, you will be thrown out of power. Let me talk of the minorities. They constitute the minorities, Muslims, the Sikhs. Christians, the Jains, the Buddhists in India, they constitute roughly around 16-17% of the population in India. Now they are not geographically concentrated. The Muslims, which are the largest minority, India has the third largest number of Muslims in the world after Indonesia and Pakistan. They are not geographically concentrated except in one state of Jammu and Kashmir where they are a majority. The rest are spread out. Kerala is 25% Muslim. Deep South. Assam, your neighbor here, has 25% Muslims. West Bengal is 30% Muslim. Bihar has 20 million Muslims. UP is 30 million Muslims. 14% of Tamil Nadu is Muslim. 8% of Andhra Pradesh is Muslim. Now they are spread out. And they have organized themselves they are so that so much out of 545 seats in parliament, one fourth of the seats are determined by how the Muslims vote. So no political party can afford to ignore in policy making what their priorities are. So that is the arithmetic of of uh, of of, of uh, democracy, which and governments. You see, when these choices, I, when I talk of choices, I want to tell you 
In one of my books I wrote in another context, choice is the beginning of sin. Choices. There's a joke about a very hard working recruit on a ship and he used to clean the decks, polish the brass from morning to evening, day in and day out and the captain was watching and the captain felt this boy deserves some rest, he works so hard, physical, manual labor the whole day and so the captain to do him a favor told him tomorrow take an easier job there is a pile of potatoes towards the kitchen side just separate them into small, medium and big and the captain met him, the boy in the evening and he was completely exhausted the captain said you have a smile on your face after working the whole day like a dog today you have a sitting job, what's your problem? he said captain Choices, small or medium or big. Just deciding on these the whole day. He said far more tiring than doing physical labor, polishing the grass. So political leadership in a democracy is constantly grappling with choice. Choice, is, as I told you, is the beginning of sin. And how do you make policy? There are so many choices before you in a democracy. Should you opt for a policy which has long-term results but not short-term gains? It requires a certain kind of leadership. <clears throat> political stability, stability of electoral term in power to think for the next five years or even beyond. One of the problems in India is governments are perpetual, <coughs> unsure how long they last. They are multi-party coalitions with wafer thin majorities so that all energy goes to political management of survival rather than policy making. And in such situations, in order to be able to constantly woo as many parts of the electorate which matter, the temptation is not long-term policies, but short-term populist policies. Policies which promise to give you short-term gain even if their long-term consequences are bad. That's called populist policy. When public policy is made in an unstable democratic system without strong political leadership, the most easy choice for policy making is populism. You decide that which is the policy of least resistance. You try to please everybody. You make promises which you know you cannot implement but which you hope will continue to the fool the people until the next election. These are pitfalls of democracy. I want you to be aware of it. Bhutan is still innocent as a young democratic country. But these are problems you will face and for which you will have to interrogate your political leaders, of which you have to be aware that politicians often face with the, there is only one word for it, with the uncertainty of power, will opt for the populist rather than the long-term policy which may be unpopular in the short term but will make foundational, qualitative changes which will stand the country in good stead in the mid-term and the long term. There are policies which 
shall increment, which don't achieve anything but which keep doing just a little more to existing policies. There are policies which are meant more for publicity impact and are dramatic. A quick statement, 10 point program, 15 point program, 200th day achievements, dramatic statements. There are policies which are tokenist. All of these have, in a democratic setup, why policy making is going on? There are policies, occasions when within a democracy, policy making suffers from policy paralysis. Why does that happen? Governments in India have faced policy paralysis. Dr. Manmohan Singh's government has been accused constantly of policy paralysis. When there is no certain focus of leadership within a democratic government, when power appears to be divided, when there are conflicting priorities which are not resolved within the decision-making elite of that government, policy falls flat between two opposing stools. Because policy making, it's very difficult and I, you will see this happening. You cannot hunt with the hound and run with the hare. You have to make choices. I keep coming back to the word choices. But if there is no clarity about what choice to make, if half the government is pulling towards a certain choice and the other half is pulling towards another choice, it ultimately leads to policy paralysis. Where since neither sides will yield ground, what happens is that nothing happens. There's a drift. Sometimes people say impatiently that dictatorships are better. At least unmindful of its consequences or its impact on the people and the opposition that could be there. People make decisions. It's the most ridiculous and short-sighted answer to the failings of public policy making in a democracy. Dictatorship is not the answer. A more efficiently working democratic system is the answer. Bhutan may not have faced it, but there are occasions of policy parents. Two strong centers of power, none willing to yield ground, both influential in their own right and nothing happens there. There is also policy paralysis in a democracy because of a multiplicity of agencies that are involved in the final decision of policy making. For instance, in India, a decision is taken of some important consequences. Decisions are then, they have to go through several clearances, as is probably true about Bhutan. But today there is a veto power being exercised by my good friend Jairam Ramesh, Ministry of Environment. Proposals were thousands of crores are pending. Because Mr. Ramesh's ministry till recently and now his successor's ministry, Jayanti, they will not provide environmental clearance. It is not a problem of Bhutan, but often there is a problem between center and state. You will soon have the problem when your local government becomes far more effective and powerful at the grassroots level. Between what the center decides and what the local government approves. Between what the center wants and what the state feels should be done. They are, all, they are all elements in a democratic structure. And here policy making is then forced into a situation of paradise. And often the, the response
response I get is, perhaps it's better not to have the complexity of democratic choice and to allow policy to be free from it. But I can tell you this is the greatest challenge. When policy making becomes impervious to what people want or what people deserve and people don't have avenues to express them, it is the biggest disaster waiting to happen for a country. But we have to deal with the system. Then there is the machinery of policy implementation in India. Kashmir Devaraji sitting here, eminent secretary, we have others who are in the bureaucracy. First of all, there are decision making within the cabinet. I'm sure Bhutan has a more homogeneous cabinet. But that, may, that is not the case in many countries. <coughs> Certainly in India it has happened that within the cabinet, there is conflict. Within the cabinet or within a ruling coalition, that one constituent can hold hostage entire policy making. I was once in the Prime Minister's office in India. I will not name the Prime Minister. And in a particular cabinet meeting, that government consisted of, I think, 18 or 19 coalition partners. And it had a majority of one in parliament. Now there was one MP who was the sole MP of his party in parliament. Never in his life has his party or this MP been always asked for his opinion so often before decisions are made. Because if he did not agree, the government would fall. There are different elements constituted. So cabinet, then the cabinet has to depend on the bureaucracy for implementation. One of the great myths is that the bureaucracy has no class interest of its own. This is my thought. <coughs> the bureaucracy can be genuinely in some cases as it should be. beyond political partisanship but it need not be beyond class interest. It represents a certain class interest. Bureaucrats mostly come from the middle class. If there is a legislation which is being asked, given to them to implement which is a sweeping legislation on land reform and some of them own land holdings in their villages and know what the impact will be of this legislation on their own holdings. The bureaucracy is a very ingenuous tribe. They can find a hundred reasons which don't exist in order to delay, postpone, bury, stymie or kill legislative decisions. figure like Mahatma Gandhi as its mentor, a person like Jawaharlal Nehru with his left of centre socialist views came to power. One of, I'm just giving you one example. The goal was that in education the focus should be on primary education, given the large level of illiteracy in India. The middle class's interest was not primary education. The middle class's interest was higher institutes of education, colleges, universities. Because they had already passed the stage where they were interested in primary education. And so, in spite of pronouncements at the highest political level about the privacy of primary education, more money was finally diverted to institutes of higher education. 
and you had a plethora of new universities, IITs, medical colleges, etc., etc., coming up. Whereas primary education was actually ignored. Which is why India presents the paradox of having the world's largest number of engineers and the largest number of people who cannot read or write. It's an unsustainable time. But it happened because policy, in spite of its best intent, was hijacked imperceptibly, silently, over the years. I'm not necessarily, I don't regret India's engineers, India's doctors have contributed, India's institutes of higher learning, learning, although they could be much better, have given India an educated middle class of vast numbers. But it's a matter of shame. There are so many people that still not read and write in India. Although the levels of literacy have gone up. But the fact that they can't read and write is still a taint on the Indian democracy. And that is a concrete example for you public policy and democratic function. Policy enunciated in response to what seemed to be the right democratic imperatives. But within the democratic setup, public policy hijacked by entrenched class interests operating also in the name of democracy. So therefore, there is the bureaucracy. There is the implementation of machinery below the bureaucracy, the lower bureaucracy. It can be a very serious issue. For instance, again let me illustrate by a concrete example. We have recently passed in India the food security. It's a laudable bill. Who can, who can oppose food security? As a politician, I cannot. I said it on television more than once. But I can question what is your implementation machinery to achieve this goal which you have announced. The policy is to be implemented by the public distribution system which has been known to be defunct or ineffective with severe leakages and rampant corruption down the line. And food has to be procured and stored and distributed by the Food Corporation of India, which the Supreme Court through its commissioners recently called genocidal. So here is a policy decision within a democratic setup meant as a laudable goal, but with transparent, transparent aims at short-term returns before elections. It shall not bear it. Even if governments act for short term interest, but it is the good of the people, it's not a bad thing. So many decisions are taken. You will see this happening in Bhutan. A decision was taken by a government about to fall in the 80s, late 80s. Prime Minister Vipis took a decision on the basis of the Mandal report for reservations to other backward classes. Now whatever the politics of it, I believe in the importance of affirmative action for segments of society which have hitherto not benefited as a result of institutional discrimination. 2,000, 3,000 years of history needs course correction. It was greatly opposed by the so-called upper caste. But I believe in spite of the politics of that decision, it was a decision of the, in the right direction. It gave them opportunities for education through education. In jobs, 
in recruitment to government jobs. And it has brought about sea change. You know, I can tell you, I went to the National Academy in Missouri. In my time, it was more or less an incestuous English speaking club. My badge in the Foreign Service, and we had to be, to join the Foreign Service, we had to be right at the top. Out of 24, 12 were from Sales students. What about the rest of India? Today, you can give the exam in any of the official Indian languages. So I don't benefit because I speak English then. Today there are reservations. And I can tell you I was recently in the academy and I go every year to lecture to the combined uh, probationers. The complexion of the academy is these are first generation qualifying bureaucrats, sons and daughters of farmers telling the field. Not sons and daughters of already entrenched families in the political and bureaucratic and corporate system of India. They have qualified on merit. They may not have the polish which they will acquire easily. They may not have the fluency in English, but they are probably far more intelligent and they deserve a chance to serve the country. So here is a decision taken at a time when the government was extremely unstable. In order to get populist support, the Mandal Commission report of BP Singh and it has led to long term consequences of India which is probably not thought of by the person who announced it. Similarly, another Prime Minister did it. He announced that it was one of those really short lived governments. He announced one third reservation for women in all local bodies in the Punjabis. <coughs> At one go, the move to give women this kind of percentage in parliament has not succeeded. People did not realize what he had done. He did it today. India has the highest such reservation for women in panchayats, millions of panchayats across the country. And in the first election, women fronted, women fronted for husbands. Fathers, brothers. By the time of the second election, they said, we rather like this power and the role we had. We will continue, we don't need your advice. And today you have the largest number, we have number of women representatives of local bodies as a result of a decision taken of policy making in a democracy, but at a time when that democratic structure was unstable, with long term consequences. This is how decisions happen and the long term consequences. A silent revolution has happened at the grassroots in terms of empowerment of women. So there are decisions which are made in, in, that, in that form also. Uh, there is the issue of corruption. The best policy in a democratic system without an actively working judicial system which establishes a nexus between crime and punishment, corruption will proliferate. And policies, especially of public welfare, automatically open avenues of corruption. There is procurement, there is storage, there is distribution, there is partnership with outside agencies. There are percentages and percentages and compromises and understanding because huge amounts of public money is going down in the implementation of a policy. So there is corruption in some areas Governments have to decide, even in a democracy, what remains 
privileged information and what can we reveal. There's another area of public policy making in a democracy. People assume that in a democracy, everything is available for people to know, but especially in areas of national security. Governments can claim privilege. Some things do need to remain outside the public realm in the interests of the people and you should have the trust that those whom we have elected will not betray the nation. But that is another area. So I'm trying to point out to you the many elements that go into it, the machinery of implementation, the decision-making process. And finally I want to speak about what can we do to ensure that within a democracy there is more effective policy. Policy making ultimately, and mark my words, in a democratic setup, is a well-intentioned compromise between different priorities, competing priorities, obvious constraints, need to do good, please those who most need to be pleased, appease others, pacify some, and so on and so forth. It is a benevolent compromise. Effective leadership makes that compromise function, implemented with verifiable impact. Poor leadership goes into drift paralysis. What do we do to ensure effective policy making in a democracy? I have always argued and I have done it uh, in my last book, Chanakya's New Manifesto. Policy making is much too serious a matter to be left to existing governments in terms of assessment and appraisal of how they are functioning. Governments will always say they are functioning. Which government will say my policy is not functioning? You need an outside agency. You need an outside agency which examines it on the criteria of ethicality, effectiveness, efficacy, performance, fidelity to goals, implementation machinery. And these bodies have been set up. There are many countries which set certain parameters. These are called the World Governance Indicators, WGI. And those indicators, there is an independent body which I believe, I have said in India that there should be a group called, can't remember what it's called, Governance Appraisal, something, I call it GAP. Governance appraisal uh, group or something. You can set up. Government should encourage an independent body consisting of people outside government. They could be a leading economist, a leading educationist, a representative of the judiciary, the chief justice or his nominee, five people.
a very important tool in democracy to ensure effective policy making and that is public pressure. Democracy is not about people remaining inert, inactive, passive and coming to life only at the time of casting a vote. Democracy is a constant exercise where vigilant citizens, aware citizens, express their opinion in an organized manner. Whenever that expression is relevant and public pressure groups on any issue, electoral reform, for instance, judicial reform, transparency in government, Public pressure groups have a decisive impact on democratic governments because ultimately they are sensitive to what the public feels because the public will vote. They are there only as a result of a check issued in their name for limited validity by the power of the people. Therefore, they cannot ignore public pressure groups. It's important. When Anna Hazaria went on a fast, the Lokpal bill finally came to parliament, however inadequately, when eight times before proposals had been proposed and dropped. But when the protests grew in Delhi on the Ramlila ground, the government had to yield. This is not by any chance a recipe for Anna. This is the expression within the democratic system of informed public choice, of responsible choice, of choice which does not oppose the system but which may have a point of view on policy making. So public pressure groups. In India we also have two other instrumentalities which have assumed importance. One is the BI, the Public Interest Litigation. I don't know if Bhutan has it. Well, it's a system that evolves on its own, the judiciary, where a group of citizens or a concerned citizen can take to the court a public interest litigation, which is about a public issue where this group or that citizen believes that what is happening is that variance to public stated policy and the law and the court must review or pass orders. And a lot of change and policy making in India has occurred as a result of public interest litigation on which the Supreme Court has pronounced judgment or given an order. And that has been the executive move or at least draft policy. Because in a democracy all elements are working. The judiciary, the media, an informed citizenry, and all have to work together. So, and the other in our country, for all its faults is the RTI, the Right to Information Act. 10 rupees and a letter and governments and offices and people are compelled to provide information within a stipulated time period of what have been the reasons for decision making and any other facts related to decision making and policy. And I can tell you I have been on the other side of the fence till recently. Almost nothing can be kept out of the purview of the RTI Act. Recently, my political party felt that the RTI Act should not apply to the functioning of political parties. The RTI Chief Commissioner had felt that political parties also, by an interpretation of law, come under RTI. And I went somewhat against my, my own party when I said that at least the financial transactions of political parties should come under RTI. Not their internal decision making, not why they choose candidate A and not candidate B for a particular constituency, but financial transaction. 
the people have the right to know. That's what I believe. But the Rifle Information Act is an important reform measure and has played a role in making public policy making in a democracy transparent by making it accountable. Otherwise, as a bureaucrat in my former avatar, I don't know how many things you can hide behind the fact that this can't be shared. We have our reasons. You can't do that. I used to tell my joint secretaries under me in DGICC as the Deputy Director General, every noting you make on a decision made should speak for itself and stand up because assume it's a public talk. It will not be hidden in your files in your cover. It can be asked. That is the kind of pressure I feel. Anyway, I gave you an overview from my thoughts of what are the elements that go into policy making in a democracy. I spoke out of personal experience and having watched governments function in a democracy and seen how policy is made and unmade. I hope it was useful to you, but I'll end by only saying two things. One is democracy in the long run is the best political system for policy making which is congruent to the interests of the people. But policy making is not necessarily perfect in a democracy. That requires special attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. But it, I think the talk could not have been, uh, the timing couldn't have been better and the content uh, more relevant than this. The, can I request you to spend a couple of minutes talking about the role of the, uh, I might call the intellectual community in policy making, the, including well, think tanks, academia, common uh, commentators, etc. Thank you, Dasho. I should begin also by expressing my happiness of seeing Foreign Secretary here. It's a great pleasure to see you here, sir. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, 
You see, in my whole emphasis on non-government actors as part of building up public opinion or informing public opinion, I think intellectuals have an important role. Uh, the columns people write, uh, the opinions expressed in the papers, the lectures given by people, somewhere they count. I can speak from personal experience recently. In my column in Times of India, I wrote about the role of the Speaker of the House. Every time we see Parliament unable to function, and I put down that this is not so much because the speaker is helpless, but because the speaker has chosen to be helpless. And I gave her precise powers and I spelled out exactly what needs to be done for those in parliament once they transgress the business rules, the decorum of the house. And this is entirely doable. And that same evening then one of the leading channels which has a nationwide audience did a special program on my column. So then it got further currency that four speakers of different houses and states in the country called me. And so a certain debate was set off on what can be done. I'm not saying uh, intellectuals often feel that they have a greater influence than actually the truth. Uh, but the fact is that they are all part of this great jostling that goes on in a democracy. It's a good thing. And columnists don't need to agree. Intellectuals don't agree. There are great divides. But somewhere it leads to public debate. A very well working democratic electoral system as the Chief Election Commissioner has ensured. And a passive, inert, uninvolved, indifferent citizen. On the other hand, and your democracy is a failure. You need citizens who follow issues, who have opinions, who discuss them, who voice them, who have organized means of expressing them. Not always to generate conflict, but in order to put pressure of accountability on the functioning of elected governments. Intellectuals play a role there. Candidates, and there is nothing very sophisticated about it. 
On the other hand, also in this, as your Excellency has said, is the choice in terms of that democratic decisions make will also depend on the quality of leadership. And uh, often, this leadership, particularly the little limited expense goodness democracy has, also depends on the short term priorities of the political activities. So, these are some of the things that uh, I think Bhutan will continue to, to find ways and means. And uh, I would like your Excellency to give further thoughts and share in case of this. Thank you. The audio was a little back, uh, the show, but you don't know women candidates. Uh, I think there's a lot that can be done. It's happening in India, at least I'm sure that will happen in Bhutan. Uh, a lot of women groups are pressurizing parliament to bring in the bill on guaranteeing a certain number of percentage of seats for women in parliament. So even if political parties would like to continue with the old patriarchal system unchanged, public pressure makes a difference. After all, women constitute roughly 50% of the electorate. So that's what I mean that in democracy, policy making is done by the democratically elected leadership. But that leadership does not act in a way. That leadership is sensitive because it's a democracy to the expression of public opinion. Otherwise it would become pretty much like Stalin or any dictatorship. Now they have to be responsive because they are in the business of dealing with public approbation and winning of elections. So I believe that political parties will be compelled, at least in India, to opt for more women candidates because of the increase in public pressure. And there is, it's, it's quite interesting. On this issue, women politicians cutting across political lines are united. Whatever their leadership is saying otherwise. So there can be more to be done. My name is Sitin Tenzin, I am a participant. Your Excellency, given your vast knowledge and deep association with Bhutan, I take the liberty to ask your views on the topic that is on discussion in the country around since the mineral policy is in its draft form. What's your kind considered views on the nationalization of the mineral resources or exploitation of it? In view of our small mineral base, sustainable development, environment, and the long term uh, interest of our time. Thank you, sir. Sir, first of all, my knowledge of this subject is not adequate for me to make a comment. I can speak far more effectively on the BJP JDU split. <laughs> I have not been following this as carefully as I should perhaps for paucity of time. Uh, secondly, I must confess, sir, I don't think it's any fine for me to comment on an internal policy decision in Bhutan. You have the leadership, you have an opposition, you have a free media, you have the judiciary, and a decision will be taken. Please pardon me if I am not able to comment on specific internal issues. I take my question back. I was referring in, uh, in view of the shaping of the public policy and democratic functions. Thank you, sir. Normally, I, I don't know this particular proposed legislation. Is it a proposed legislation on nationalization of minerals you are talking about? Yes. Uh, I, I don't know. The Democracy at the future of Bhutan. 
Well, I believe that uh, like any policy, you know, I find that there is the differences of this context and specificity of a country as against another. All policy making does and should go through the same mechanisms of review, discussion, debate, dissent and decision making. A policy is announced. The media must comment. Inform people must give their views. There should be discussion on television. If the opposition has a point of view, it must be expressed. There should be debate. That's how policy is made within a democratic setting. If it is felt that it is, I do not know this particular situation, I am just talking how it would happen in India. If, for instance, those affected by the implementation of this policy believe that this policy is malafide, it goes against the letter and spirit of the constitution or other legal rights which belong to a citizen or a particular trade, they can go to court. The court can review. These are the avenues available in a democracy. And they must all play the role in decision. Excellency, thank you for a very informative and uh, substantive talk. Uh, my name is Tashobia. I am a member of Parliament in the National Council and I am also a faculty at Rixia. My question is, where do you draw the line between an executive order passed by the Prime Minister and the Cabinet, a policy decision passed by the Planning Commission, and law? This is now becoming, as we grapple with the changes brought about by democracy, we have to understand uh, some of these nuances. For example, uh, in the last government, the <coughs> Uh, government decided to implement the pedestrian day. It was very controversial and it was later revoked by the new government. But uh, when a government implements a decision like the pedestrian day, which impacts uh, the entire country and causes a lot of public inconvenience, does such a decision necessarily require legislative endorsement? Uh, where do you draw the line? Uh, if it is an executive order in the case of India, is there a termination date that people shall walk on Tuesdays, but this is effective for uh, the next uh, 10 um, months or so till the next session of parliament when it is tabled? So I think that this is causing some degree of uh, confusion among bureaucrats, lawmakers, and uh, the public at large which benefit uh, from a response. Thank you, sir. I think, uh, Dasha, that's an excellent question. Uh, this is a grey area in all the norms. Over a period of time, it becomes clear what the limitations of an executive order are. You can transfer in a bureaucrat is an executive order. Once a policy has acquired legislative sanction, making minor changes in the implementing, implementation, implementation machinery are executive orders. Taking day-to-day -day decisions on law and order, on other matters of municipal importance are executive orders. The Pedestrian Act I think fell in a grey area. My personal opinion, if you ask me, completely without any political judgments, was that it should have been challenged in court. As affecting freedom of movement. And let there be a discussion on what personal freedoms need to be constrained in the larger public court. A case must be made out that 
what is achieved through such an order outweighs the inconvenience and other losses that accrue as a consequence of it. If that is not done, it sits with precedent for executive orders with very large impacts on lives of people which remain unchallenged become the norm. Now every democracy, by the way I am not doubting the intent of that body, I am saying ultimately democracies must evolve the machinery to question, interrogate, discuss, challenge, arrive on a separate synthesis for every decision making process. In India, for instance, there are very clearly defined business rules but about what process of decision making needs legislative sanction and what does not. Often, when parliament is not in session, even those matters which require clearance of parliament are passed through ordinances. That has also been criticized because ordinances are usually the resort of last uh, uh, choice. They are not meant to become the norm and they can be challenged. And Parliament has done it. I am not aware whether the opposition raised it in Parliament as being requiring legislative approval given the majorities of the last parliament here even that would not have been difficult uh, therefore the only option was judicial review Absence of democracy is no room for freedom and aspire for inform inclusive policy formation. Is it is it is too much of democracy in the sense of excessive freedom? Just as equally stifling to the formulation and implementation of such policies. If so, then where and how do you draw the line on this freedom so that policy formulation doesn't become policy paralysis? And in this regard, do you think that the two party parliamentary set of the Bhutan has adopted, has adopted the answer? Last and, the last part. and in this regard, do you think that the two party parliamentary set of the two, two political party parliamentary set of the parliamentary set of two parties is that the will, they, will that be an answer? And, and further referring to your example on the bureaucracy being free of class interest. Uh, and that is, uh, is, not, uh, is not the case, so uh, it kind of seems that eventually it all boils down to the conflict between choices that you want to make as a responsible and consumer citizens and the choices that you end up making being a self-serving consumer and individual. So in that regard, do you think that the later always trumps over the former? Democracy is unlimited. 
There are reasonable constraints to most freedoms. When there is an absence of leadership, when there is the absence of political vision, when there is the absence of institutions, I do not care about intents. I want institutions to guarantee their intent. When there is the absence of institutions, when there is the absence of leadership, when there is the absence of political vision, Democracy becomes hijacked by what is called, you are calling the excess of democracy. Because an excess of democracy by definition is anarchy. Where beyond the rule of law and beyond reasonable constraints, everybody believes they have the freedom to do everything. But that is not democracy. There is. The, 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 the error that we make is to believe that democracy itself is about no constraints, no restraints. It is not. Actually, democracy is a very disciplined system. And very often that discipline has to be invoked and applied by people themselves. That is what I say, for instance, about the functioning of our parliament. I wrote it, I say it, people believe it, people are disgusted, and there is going to be reform. People walk into the well of the house. Anything that is not rooted in the ground becomes a missile to be thrown at somebody. What kind of behavior is it? It's a 5,000 year old civilization. What have we been reduced to? But that is not democracy functioning, it's energy. And there are rules already available to control it, to run the house with decorum. In its entire history, the mother of democracy, the House of Commons, has not been adjourned for a single day. I was joking in India that we will set our own record that there is not a single day when the house is not in jail. <laughs> so, democracy has rules, democracy has discipline, democracy must have decorum, democracy must have restraints, democracy must have respect for other people's opinions. I say this often in television or debates, that everybody is shouting. I said, let's not reduce this discussion to personal matters. Let's hear the other person's point of view. Democracy is not part of democracy. Anything else is not democracy. Okay, uh, we'll take the last question. My name is Dharwaraj Sarman. <coughs> Your Excellency, my question pertains to the choices you talked about in the democratic system. Recent, re recently we had uh, our second election. In the first round we had four choices. And finally in the uh, general election we had only two choices. Now my question is, in a democratic institution, can there be public intervention so that our choices are this uh, choices, we have the uh, number of choices, at the same time the uh, public policy is not paralyzed by policy governments and things like that. Can such an exercise deepen democracy or it will compromise democracy? What exercise? I mean like we have that uh, choices we have without compromising on the choices, at the same time without paralyzing the government with all policy. All the parties to participate. Yes, at the same time my question is like this, your exercise. For example, I will join the coalition, but I should have a condition that I will support the coalition for five years. I cannot withdraw just as in when I like. 
Will, will such a public policy intervention strengthen democracy or will it uh, compromise democracy? That's a very interesting question you ask. First of all, the system you have chosen is now part of your constitution. You chose a system which in Bhutan it's workable also. Many parties complete, the two leading parties go beyond the first round to the next round. I say this is an interesting question because I speak at great length in the context of India about the solution that you are offering. Now, in India what has happened is, I'll come back to your question after explaining the Indian context. I believe this political situation in India today is not what those who wrote our constitution envisaged or expected. Those who wrote our constitution believed that parliamentary elections will throw up one party with a stable majority which will have five years to do and deliver governance as per the promises made to the people, broadly absent. Last 20 years we have a situation where no one party has the majority. And so we have 18, 19 member coalition party in government. Right? And there is no such mechanism as you are proposing that those parties are committed to support the government of which they are part for the five years of the government. So governments are necessarily unstable because if one constituent pulls out, governments fall. The number of coalition parties in the coalition I don't have a problem with. In a sense, in a country like India, and perhaps in some ways in your country, the number of parties that have sprouted over a period of time represent different interests within India. They are in fact representative of the democratization of parliamentary politics. At one time there was only one Banyan party, the Congress party. And other regional interests had to be subsumed or subordinated within the leadership of the Congress. Today you have powerful regional groups. They represent millions of people. For instance, in Bihar, it's 110 million people. It sends 40 members of parliament. It has a voice. It has a leader who has won three times. So the number of parties is not the problem. The problem is how to make the number of parties within a government function. That is the problem. There I have proposed in the Indian context that one parties must announce before the election what coalition they are a part of. Because that is what the voter wants. The voter says I will vote for party A and against party B. After the election, he finds party A and party B have joined hands, which is a betrayal of the voter. The voter must know that A, B, C, D, E, F, G are part of this coalition and these are a part of the other coalition. So, coalitions must identify and announce them before election. Second step, having done that, they must agree to a common governance agenda. What is doing in Denmark? Because it was a hard house with the three member coalition. For 17 days, the three parties sat down working 18 hours a day to hammer out a 76 page document of agreed goals on governance. Similarly, in the United Kingdom, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democrats, because it was a hung house and they have formed a government together in 2010, they worked out over 11 days a multi pronged program on deficit reduction, income tax, immigration, education, human rights, etc. So they, these 
This pre-identified coalition must publicly profess their loyalty to a common hammer-down governance agenda. Now, if after this one of these coalitions comes to power, I have proposed that no constituent of that coalition can withdraw support for a minimum period of three years. I could have said five, I said three. At least for three years there is political history. For three years, and even if they withdraw support, their support is due. It's a discipline. It's like our anti-defection law. At one level, it's a it's it circumscribes absolute democratic choice. Legislators should have the freedom to choose which party they wish to be. But in India, it has reduced itself to horse trade. Whoever paid the highest price, the legislator walked from one party to another. So, it was a specific situation of India that we came up with a solution through the anti defection law. That unless one third of a party moves, that person cannot change party. Similarly, what you are proposing is that if all parties come to power or more than one, this is a choice for Bhutan to make. You have already got a system that to my mind is functioning. But I can tell you, the discipline of coalition politics is not easy to acquire. And on the other hand, for a country of Bhutan size, you have, I think, a fairly well working system. Thank you, Your Excellency, for sharing with us your thoughts and views very openly. It is indeed a pleasure to always listen to your lectures, and I'm sure it must have been a very wonderful opportunity for the audience from Finsling, where such opportunities are very rare. And as we uh, distinguished ladies, uh, guests, ladies and gentlemen, before we end the third Friday Forum Lecture, I would like to invite the Project Coordinator of the Royal Institute for Governance and Strategic Studies, Mr. Tsor, to give the closing remarks. Excellency Ambassador Pawan Varma, Dashos, uh, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen. In his address to the nation on 17 December 2012, His Majesty the King has said, and I quote, Remember, achieving democracy is not the goal. The real fruits of our efforts should be that democracy brings greater unity harmony and prosperity to our nation. Democracy must be able to fulfill the aspirations of our people." Unquote. As a nation, democracy, one of the biggest challenges that Bhutan faces today, perhaps, is the lack of in-depth knowledge and understanding on democracy, democratic governance, and democratic principles. For democracy to flourish and fulfill the noble objectives with which it was instituted by our beloved kings, it does not suffice that only those who we elect to power or only a handful of intellectuals here and there know democracy well. Every single voter, indeed every single citizen, ought to know well the system by which they are guided and governed, if that system is to serve them well and fulfill their aspirations. His Excellency Pavan, Ambassador Pavan Varma has so eloquently talked about the process, the politics, the intricacies and the complexities of make, making public policy in a democratic setup and how they guide or misguide democratic functioning. 
This has been an enriching and an educative lecture and a very relevant one at that. Because the issues discussed and the experiences shared either face or will face us and our country as we strike into the 10, 21st century as a democratic nation. Your Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Institute, its governing board, faculty, staff and course participants, and on my own personal behalf, I would like to express our deepest gratitude to Ambassador Pawan Kumar Verma for delivering this captivating Friday Forum lecture here at Res Riggs, despite your busy schedule back home. We are truly honored to have Your Excellency in our midst this Friday morning, and we do hope that we will get to listen to more of such inspiring lectures from you in the days and years ahead. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I would also like to thank the 23 course participants who have helped us in whatever way is possible in hosting this Friday Forum Lecture, despite the hectic schedule here at Riggs and also preparations for their trip to Singapore starting tomorrow. I would like to thank officials of the Chukka Zonka and Fensling Dunka, Fensling Trombe, Royal Britain Police, Royal Britain Army, Haki and Troop Hotels and all others, other agencies and individuals who have helped us in organizing this event. We are also grateful to Ambassador Veena Miguel and his officials at the Royal Putinese Embassy in New Delhi for helping us in coordinating this important event. Thanks also due to my own staff here at RICS who have worked very hard on a daily basis to put up this show. Last but not the least, I would like to thank all distinguished guests and, guests and participants for joining us today and we look forward to your continued enthusiasm and participation in the Friday Forum Lectures in future too. Before I conclude, we would like to offer a small momento as a token of appreciation and goodwill to His Excellency. Thank you and touch the minute.